Ladies and gentlemen, we've got another lovely guest coming on now, and it's part of the prominent women in aviation. And my goodness me, when I looked at what our next guest has done, I actually said I wasn't sure whether to prepare an interview with her or ask her for her autograph. And this is a lady who is full of passion. She loves the industry and she loves the time that she's had within it and the time that she's got ahead of her. And it's such a privilege to introduce Janet Eaton. So Janet, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you very much, Chris. I'm excited to be here. Part of my passion, not only in my job and my career, is I feel we need to be ambassadors to aviation. And I absolutely love trying to encourage others to get into this field. So thank you for the opportunity. It's an absolute pleasure. And that's exactly what we want to do. The next generation, let them know what a great industry this is, irrespective of this damn crisis we're going through now. So Janet, I've got you down and what a wonderful title, bit of a mouthful, so I'll try and get through it. Vice President, Worldwide Strategy and Business Developments, Commercial Systems and Services for Sikorsky, a Lockheed Martin company. My God, that's a big old title, Janet. Huh? Absolutely. You know, I've moved around in so many divisions and jobs within this uh, rotorcraft industry. Uh, a little bit of background, I've been in aviation over 32 years, including 22 with Sikorsky. I actually left Sikorsky for a while, for about 10 years, where I had the opportunity to actually fly and sell for Bell Helicopter. And I did everything from engineering, manufacturing, program management, customer support. But my passion was in marketing and sales. And in this new role that I've been given, it has responsibility worldwide for our commercial products. And that's uh, the Sikorsky S-92 and the Sikorsky S-76 aircraft. Fantastic. Fantas now, now that you mentioned the products, the 76 is such a beautifully quiet helicopter, probably, probably more quiet than what people would expect. And the fact that you don't even need headphones, you can listen to people talking, it's incredible from the old days. I remember the first time I flew in a helicopter was from London Gatwick to, to Heathrow and back with, I think it was British Caledonian then. And it was an amazing experience to be lifted up and to hover and then go off in a direction. But I remember the noise was incredible. Yeah, you know, and that's funny. Most people, when they think of helicopters, they think of being loud and noisy and they're dripping oil and they're dangerous. And, you yeah. know, the 76, especially in the VIP market, it's like riding in the back of a limousine. Um, we have what we call active vibration control. So very, very smooth. You would never think you're in a helicopter. We have um, at noise reduction, we have a, what we call a cocoon interior, we have a quiet tail rotor, and all of that gives the VIP the experience of being in a boardroom. He can conduct his business, he or she, carry on a conversation. I know I don't have a loud voice, and when I'm doing a demonstration in the back of the aircraft, I don't have to raise my voice, which is kind of the best way to explain the quietness of the aircraft. And all those features, it's not just VIP, you know, they carry over into the EMS market. Um, a great story that one of our um, children's hospital had is they had to transport, it was a 20-week um, uh, premature baby that had to be transported to the hospital. And they knew if they put it in an ambulance, the jostling on the road could basically rupture the baby's vessels in the brain. And so when they considered all options, they ended up putting it in our S-76D helicopter and the baby made it to the hospital and survived and uh, is about two years old today. So it's really kind of neat when you see that technology being into caring into saving lives and fulfilling cr critical missions. My passion is definitely first responders. Um, I'm really big into the firefighting market, helped bring yep. a product called the Firehawk. Um, that's, I think, what makes me so passionate about this business. And you were actually involved in the, in the design as well, weren't you, in the program? I was. I was an engineer on the original program. I helped oversee the build of it and manufacture of it, and then eventually took into sales. But, you know, part of that was capturing the voice of the customer. Way back in the 90s, we worked with Los Angeles County Fire Department 
to understand what is it so special about the Sikorsky Blackhawk, why you want that in your mission. What is it about your mission that we have to answer? And when we looked at performance capabilities and just the fact that, you know, firefighting is a battlefield and they wanted an aircraft made for battle. So that was the foundation. And then we grew from there. And um, I, I haven't mentioned this yet, or we haven't gotten into this yet, but I'm a, both a fixed wing and a helicopter pilot. And when I see the conditions that these pilots fly in and what they have to go through, what they're facing, you know, the, you know especially smoke and um, everything that they're flying in is absolutely amazing. These are the most difficult flying conditions in the world and they do it without pause. They don't even think about putting their life in jeopardy. They just do it and respond. So I have the utmost respect and humbled by what these guys and women do every day. It's really yeah, kind of neat to be part of it. It's incredible, isn't it? And now, correct me if I'm wrong. So if I'm watching the news now and I see all these bushfires and, you know, the fires that are creeping up to people's houses, et cetera, and I see the helicopters going over, that would be, that would be a model that you've been involved in, would it? Absolutely. You know, the, the helicopters and firefighting, their best is initial response or initial attack to put the fire out before it gets started. Yeah. And then if a fire gets beyond that point, um, then it goes into, you know, these big heavy wing tankers. And what the, what the helicopters do is when particular homes are burning, those tankers can't get as accurate as a helicopter can. So the helicopters are used to get close to homes. They're close to, say, a, a, a ground crew is in jeopardy from the fire. They're going to go and lay fire lines down to help protect the ground crews below. So they, they change their role moves from initial attack to closer support. And uh, again, amazing the fiery conditions they go into for that. And, and you know when they're carrying, when they're carrying the water and, and you see the helicopter coming and then it just drops and it looks as if there's not much of a spread of water. I mean, that's a huge volume of water that they're dropping. Yeah, um, there's all different types based on what model. Our, our particular uh, Firehawk carries a thousand gallons of water and we designed a computer controlled tank that you can vary the coverage levels. So if you have deep foliage, you need to penetrate through, or if you have um, shallower brush, so you can vary that line from being, you know, 800 feet to, um, I think it's over, you know, quarter of a mile. They have all different levels to set that at. And uh, that's the benefit, you know, being able, the more water you can carry, the more density, it's really about the density of the drop and the head pressure yeah. of that water to penetrate. So it makes a big difference, you know, you, there's all different tactics in firefighting and belly tanks versus Bambi buckets, but um, it, it really, the, the larger volume of water and the more head pressure, the better you're gonna have it, put, better chance you have at putting that fire out. It's incredible though. And, and, and again, coming back to the skill of the pilots, when they're carrying that sort of weight, you can imagine the sort of controls they have to have to where, and then all of a sudden that weight just disappears. Right. You know, you expect right. to see the helicopter go boom, straight up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, and that's another beauty part of using a military technology. It was meant to carry these heavy loads and the dampening systems on the Sikorsky products are meant so you don't have that huge reaction. But there's definitely a change in torque setting not yeah. violent, but there definitely is. And it's the skills of the pilot. It's not just about, you know, where you're dropping, making sure you have an accurate drop. The you know, Out in LA County, they get winds up to 60, 70 miles an hour and trying to figure out how much that, that wind is gonna, how far is it gonna blow my water and how do I make that target? And then also being able to uh, operate at night. A lot of firefighting helicopters can't go at night. If you have that ability, humidity levels are up, winds tend to die down, you can get really effective with the aircraft. And again, great, great resource of the, having military technology to do that. It's amazing. It's amazing. Coming back to the premature baby, was it, was it, a, was it a boy or a girl? It was a girl. <laughs> it was a girl. I was hoping it was a boy and I was curious as to whether or not they would have named it Igor. <laughs> Mr. Sikorsky. Yeah, he's an amazing man. I mean, he started, if you look at his, he was a Russian immigrant. He came to the United States. He, he started with a crew over in a, a, bought a chicken farm over in Long Island. He couldn't pay his crew. He went to 
you know, the local garbage dump to find scraps of metal. And it was a composer, Rachmaninoff, actually, who gave him a check of $5,000 that started this company. And Igor, and he, he had this vision. He, he used fixed wings to raise money, but he always had a vision of vertical flight. And um, that vision was he saw vertical flight being used to save lives. He said, a fixed wing can fly over and drop flowers, but a helicopter could actually go in and save a life. So he, his, he pursued his vision and, uh, you know, every day our employees are reminded that's our heritage and we've, it's so rewarding to be part of something like that. Plus his purpose that he made way back then um, is true to this day. So that's the whole point of a purpose, which is sometimes so much better than a mission and a vision statement. So back in the, what would that have been, the 30s and the 40s when, when the, first, uh, the first helicopter was, was produced? Yeah, it was actually, actually, I was in the 30s when he first started. It was really a, not until the 1960s that we got into a production of helicopters. But uh, way back when, 1935, 39, excuse me, he took his maiden flight in the VS-300, which is the first practical helicopter designed today. And, uh, you know, the heritage continues on. That's brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. Um, now, as far as the, the different models, so we've, we've looked at, we've, we've spoken about the firefighting, we've spoken about the sort of medivac or, or, you know, looking after people. When you talk about the VIPs and about how, not surprised, but how probably pleased they are with how quiet and how private, and you look at some of the designs inside the helicopter, I mean, it's incredible what you can fit in. <laughs> yes, you know. It's amazing. And, uh, the 92, that probably amazes me the most. The S92 has a full stand-up cabin. It's over six feet tall, and you can fit up to 19 passengers in an airline transport. But in a VIP, we've had showers and bathrooms. You think about it, in a helicopter, I may go 20 minutes, maybe an hour, <laughs> and having the need for a shower or a bathroom in the helicopter, having a full galley there so you can cook, it's really... You know, it's like a corporate jetliner in the VIP. It's really amazing. And it goes back to, you know, active vibration control, noise yep. reduction, the technology today to make that uh, like, like your own personal limo or your own home. Yeah. And, and obviously for everybody around the world, we're used to seeing, you know, presidents of the U.S. getting on the helicopters and everything. And, and that started since Eisenhower. So now they all, they all have access. Right. They're, all, they're all very familiar with it. Right, and today, you know, that is the new presidential aircraft today. The S-92 version is the new president's aircraft today. So as you pointed out, every president since Eisenhower has only flown in a Sikorsky powder. I so it's a, another part of our heritage that we're proud of. And, and that goes back to, you know, having the military technology there, this ensuring the safety and the reliability and the redundancy are just critical in, in every mission segment. You look at offshore oil, having to go you know, far distances yeah. over water, having that reliability. The last thing you want to do as a pilot is having to ditch into the North Sea or into some of these freezing conditions or, or you know, hurricane search and rescue. When do you do that? When, when you've got a hurricane in some of the most difficult flying conditions in the world and you're being asked to go out there. So you really need to make sure you have power and performance, safety and reliability under your belt. But every mission segment requires that. Yeah, no, it's incredible. And what, what a privilege it must be to be selling such a product. It's very, very rewarding. Um, one of the things, you know, I do, I still, I, I've moved on to the commercial. As you mentioned, I was part of the Firehawk program, but I still talk to these firefighters and respond, first responders, stay in touch right, right in California. Now we've got the Bobcat fire. We've got some so it seems every year the fire conditions get worse and worse and grow stronger and more violent. So um, I constantly stay in contact because, as I said, I'm humbled by what they do, but I'm inspired by them. And uh, it's rewarding to be part of an industry and part of a product that's making a difference in people's lives and saving lives. I'm not doing it, but I'm watching a product. And I had a little, little piece of that journey. So it feels good. Ah, oh, it's incredible. And what an incredible thing and story that Igor Sikorsky 
his background and, and how he came and everything. And then you've got the heads of state flying around in something that he, he had such foresight and imagination and determination to produce. It's incredible. Yeah, he's a, he was a visionary, that's for sure. And his son, Sergei Sikorsky, is still with us today. We still use them, use him for different events. And he's like a rock star in this industry, <laughs> you know, having his son and the stories he tells. You know, he talks about when he was a kid sitting on his dad's lap going for a test flight. This is an open, you know, the VS-300, there, there's no doors or roofs. It was an open wire cockpit with a leather seatbelt and a kid strapped here. <laughs> it's really amazing when you think about the pioneers of aviation yeah. and as myself, how difficult it is why to go from flying an airplane to a fixed wing. You, you can't explain it. You know, you get into penduluming and then all of a sudden, boom, it happens and you've got that technique down. So what, as he developed it, how did he know he didn't design the flight controls wrongs or if he just didn't know how to fly a helicopter? Mm -hmm. I, I am just amazed at a, engineers back there and what they did. The, these, um, he says the individual of, uh, or the, the um, spark of mankind, I'll get the quote, but it has to do with the, the, um, in, the work of an individual is the spark in this innovation and for mankind. Yeah. And it really is. But an individual can spark it, anything. Yeah, it's so incredible. I mean, there's incredible people now doing things, but when you think of the conditions and the, and, and the, the knowledge or the lack of that somebody had way back then, and they were putting so much on the line, you know, just to get to certain basics, which when you look back now, you think, well, yeah, okay, we could have done that. But in that day and age, it must have been incredible. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, yeah. and there's, there's some heroes of aviation, not just within Sikorsky, the entire industry, but, you know, many of his, the people that he met too, presidents coming to see him because of this vision that he had. It's, yeah. um, you know, astronauts, pilots, Lindberghs. We, we have an office for, for Igor Sikorsky that's perfectly preserved from the day he passed away. And really? he keeps the whole story in there, you know, artifacts from when he was in Russia and different meetings and photos. It's a really kind of amazing, and it feels good when you're walking through the factory floor and you walk into this step back in time into this history of aviation. It's just in awe of what this man accomplished. That must be incredible. One day, one day, Jeanette, one day. I hope I'll be able to see you. Have, one you day. have an open invitation. Come to Sikorsky. I'll give you a personal tour. Yeah, I look forward to that. Now, somebody else who obviously should be thanked for, for your career and what you did was your mother. Yes, my mom actually and my dad. Yeah. Um, my dad, you know, and I, I guess I was a tomboy growing up. He always had me around cars. He brought me into the machine shop with him. And he was an engineer. And he always wanted me to stay. He, not, not, he actually was in the Army as an aviator. But he never exposed me to helicopters and aviation. He was a helicopter aviator. But he never exposed me to that. He wanted me to have a technical career. And my mom, I believe it or not, I have a number of degrees in education, but when I was in high school, I did not even want to go to college. And my mom said to me, she said, Janetti, men and money can come and go, but no one can ever take away your education. Yes. <laughs> so yes. She, she just encouraged me to keep going. And Sikorsky at that time, we had a 100% tuition reimbursement program. So I went and got my master's in business. I got my master's degrees in engineering. I actually have three, a total of three master's degrees. Went to Harvard Business School, Rensselaer Polytech, Boston University, an Ivy League school that I never, I, growing up as a kid, we never had the money to send me to school like that. And um, so when Sikorsky had the opportunity, I just went for it. And I, I think back to my career and I think a lot of the, uh, how lucky and fortunate I am that have these opportunities. And I remember, I never said no to anything. I was kind of like Jim Carrey and Yes Man. Anytime there was an opportunity, I tried for yeah. it, I went for it. And I realized now that was key to my, at the time I didn't know, but I really opened myself up to possibilities, even as scared as I was, or thought I didn't have a shot at this. I always, if someone offered me something, I always went for it. Yep. And 90% of the time, I, I, I got what I asked for. <laughs> so it's an amazing journey. 
but that that's a lot that's a lot about the person and it's also a lot about life isn't it if you if you're prepared to open as many doors as possible there's going to be so many opportunities there but if you limit yourself to only a few doors you've got less choice less chance so you know it's it's a good thing to do you know take take that risk take that jump and put yourself out there right and i would encourage anybody who is thinking about this industry or trying to figure out what they want to do in their life again open yourself up to all opportunities but more importantly try to figure out what is it that makes you tick what is it that gives you passion what is it that excites you to go to work or if you're not working it you know is it the helicopter noise that every time you go by you're looking up to the sky to say what is that you know um, what what do you like if it's an engineering why do you want to do it um, and once I really um, figured out what my passion was and in the beginning I thought you know taken after my dad he was an engineer he wanted me to be technical I thought that was the right thing to do and I fortunately had a mentor I, I, I had done a rotation program so I got to see everything from being a, a foreman on the manufacturing line to being running a grassroots marketing campaign and I realized I loved hearing our customers' stories. And I love working with the customers and trying to find out solutions to their problems. And I wanted to get into sales. And that's when I had a boss who said, Jeanette, you know, you have all the technical skills, you've got all the educations and degrees, but if you can't walk the walk as well as talk the talk, these men are gonna chew you up and spit you out. You need to go get your pilot's license. And at that time, I, I couldn't afford helicopters. So I'm like, okay, well, challenge on. Let me get my fixed wing ratings and let yeah. me, that's a lot cheaper that way. So there's aviation physiology you need to learn about. Even talking with TSA and the tower, it's like it's whole language in aviation. So understanding everything there is, weather, um, everything there is about flying, getting that done. And then when I had the opportunity, I transitioned to helicopters, uh, and, and that. So, so the difference when you when you did the fixed wing, how how long did it actually take you? Uh, that actually took a couple years, yeah. <laughs> because yeah. I did my fixed wing first. I went it was about a year for my private. It was about a year for my commercial, and about a year for my instrument rating. So my initial was a year, but uh, when I finally got all of my ratings, it was it was about three years to get that. And I was doing it, you know, funding it myself, part-time, going it. I did get some tuition reimbursement. But, uh, you know, and especially in the Northeast, you get weather, you get snow, you get days you can't fly. So it was a combination. But it took a while, but you persevere. And, and I found out, you know, even in a fixed wing um, aspect, so many part of, parts of that really helped me in my career, helped me so when someone's talking about an instrument approach, I could understand what they're talking about. Yeah. And talking about, you know, whether it's an ILS or an RNP, there's all these different types of, of avionics that are in systems in the aircraft. Well, now I understand how they really work and why is it important for my customer that that particular gauge has to work accurate and that there's no tolerance yeah. of error in it. Um, there, there's so much of my engineering career that I actually use more in getting my pilot's license because in the event of an emergency, if you have a, a fire, say, in the aircraft, that's my biggest fear. I need to understand is electrical, is it hydraulic? What's going on with it? Where is it coming from? How can I quickly, you know, troubleshoot the system and try to get to the source of it before it has a chance? And when you're in the air, if you don't respond quickly, you know, it's a matter, it literally is a matter of life and death. I'm not exaggerating, you know, that yeah, yeah. you have to, especially helicopters, you have to be really, really sharp and on the money. And the only way to be that is through training and really understand the aircraft, yeah. you know, from a, from a mechanics perspective, as well as a pilot's perspective. Yeah, because they're, I mean, like from, from somebody who doesn't know a great deal about helicopters, it always appears to me like the bumblebee. <laughs> because aerodynamically, a bumblebee shouldn't be able to fly. And I would imagine, like the helicopter issue, they're not going to glide. So if something goes wrong, you've got to know uh, exactly what to do. You do, but what amazed me or what was a, a big learning for me is, you know, with an airplane, they will glide, especially this li the little ones. They'll glide and 
but you have to find a landing spot that, yeah. that has at least a, a flat, long enough runway that you're not going to topple over. You know, you can't just land in the water. You can't just yeah. set her down anywhere. You, there's guide wires. You have to have an open area. Well, in a helicopter, especially going through my training, I learned they would tell me, I, we're, we're on, a, on a big runway and there's three X's and they're saying, Jeanette, I want you, I'm going to cut your engine and I need you to glide to spot three. And, you know, at first you're like, holy cow, this thing's going to sink like a rock. Yeah. But you actually, helicopters are more maneuverable than fixed wing in order to be able, in the event of emergency, place it down and find a, a parking lot, find, you know, find a little dot you've got, postage stamp you've got to la land on. Um, that's, the, that's one of the key benefits they learn. If you, if you have the right airspeed, enough airflow going up through the rotors, those, they will glide. It's just for a matter of how long. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, the how long, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> that's something I wouldn't like to experience, but I believe you. Now, when you did, when you did, the, when you did your, um, your, um, the rotary and you went over to helicopters, that's when you got the opportunity with Bell, wasn't it, providing, yes. yeah. Right, and, it, you know, I, again, very, very fortunate. You know, one thing that Bell does um, that I really admire about them, that all of their salespeople, you not only have to be rated, they wanted you to be current. And they wanted, you know, the, which is, you know, an excellent recommendation that I would um, give to any helicopter company because you want your salespeople to be credible. Yeah. And you, if, you know, there's nothing more um, uh, credible than when I'm doing a demonstration, when I'm getting out of the cockpit, when I land up at, say, NYPD and jump out of the cockpit, that they're like, oh, she does know what she's talking about. She's not just an engineer, and they just didn't send a face over here. Um, and they, they, you know, you, you see a change where they light up and they listen to what you have to say, and they respect you for having that ability. And so what was really cool with Belle is that, um, because I was one junior uh, to the position, I had to, before I could be put into a cockpit with a, with a customer or do a demo or do a delivery, I needed to, to build my time. So I had the opportunity at yeah. Bell, the aircraft are, are built in Montreal, Canada, and I had the opportunity to deliver them across the United States. And uh, there are so many days that I was doing some of these ferry flights that I said, pinch me. I can't believe I'm getting paid for this. Um, my I, I, I had shared some stories where, you know, my, I was on a trip to Missoula, Montana, and I saw herds of elk and herds of these black pronged uh, uh, antelope. And I saw like real cowboys. I didn't think real cowboys existed, but they do over there. They're taking them over to mar market and you'd see them herding cattle and you'd pop over a ridge and all of a sudden there's this fence with trucks and you're like, how did, these, how did this happen? How did they get here? And um, I just saw some beautiful parts of the country that I never would have imagined that I'd have the opportunity and again, going, oh my gosh, I'm getting paid for this. What a cool job, what a cool industry. So I, I am very fortunate that Bell, Bell you know, had the confidence in me and invested in me to, to uh, give me that flight time and um, ended up uh, salesman of the year at Bell Helicopter one year. And I know it all stems back to getting my ratings and my credibility. It's so amazing. thank yeah. you, Bell, for that. No, it's amazing. But, but what you're saying there about credibility, it, that, that happens in life a lot. And, and sometimes people forget that if you're faced with conflict from people who think you don't know what you're talking about, you haven't got the practical experience, it doesn't really matter how good you are. It's a, it's a barrier that's very difficult to overcome. And I, I remember once I was responsible for, um, for, for, for some freighter operations. And some of the guys were always saying, yeah, but you've never trimmed an aircraft. You don't know that. And, and thankfully, Lufthansa also, same thing. I, I spoke to, the, to my boss at the time and I said, look, I need to. He said, yep. And I went on a six-week course, you know, to do weight and balance and then got my license in Sharjah and Shannon. And straight after that, you see the difference between people who are trying to challenge you and then working out, well, hold on a second, he's done it as well. So I, I take my hat off to you for what you've done. It's incredible. I didn't and realize you had your ratings as well. Pardon? I didn't realize you had your ratings as well. Oh, I'm on, I'm, I was only in weight and balance and trimming. Uh, and okay. Believe you me, if somebody gave me the opportunity to, to, to um, start to fly now, I would, I would jump at it. And to see the sights that you said you've seen must be amazing. Yeah. 
Incredible. It really is. You know, and like you bring up weight and balance. That's just one aspect of being a, a pilot and making sure you're in proper trim with the aircraft and you do a proper weight and balance. And, you know, uh, another trip flying over the Grand Canyon was probably, again, some people never in their life get an opportunity to even see it. And here I am flying a helicopter over low level. It was just breathtaking. Yeah. Um, you know, rare, very... I did the walk. Oh, you did. I did, that, I did that. But you know something? The only thing that surprised me is how little safety was around outside of the of the building where the walk is, because you could go right up to the edge. And I was I was looking at people taking pictures and seeing how far down they could sit. And I'm thinking, my God, what are you doing? It was yeah. madness. What? How long ago was this? When this you went over. It was probably uh, maybe how many years ago? Six years? Five, six years ago? Okay. As I, I, last year, actually, I flew a helicopter out to California and at to Vegas for a show and went over it. And I noticed there's the east side and the west side of the canyon. And on the west side, they actually, I guess, part of the ledge they've closed off and they put like glass panels now. So you can't, you can't, maybe they must have had an incident, but they have these big, huge glass panels around the edge. So no, probably, so nobody yeah. takes a bad step or has an, has an incident there. Or somebody gives someone else the elbow. I could imagine, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. You fight with your spouse. Whoops. Yeah, yeah. Now another thing, you've obviously had the opportunity to meet celebrities who are getting involved in in uh, you know transport and and familiarising themselves with your various portfolio. And I see you you've got a picture with one particular celebrity who everybody knows, and he's quite he's quite infamous at the moment. And yes, he is. In debate um on tv now, yes uh, mr trump or now president trump when he was trump industries running that they're they're a sikorsky operator and customer so had the opportunity to meet him and work with his organization and now president of the united states president trump continues to fly on a sikorsky being the s92 so flying in our vip s92 that was just he was an amazing man. Whether you like him or not, he is an amazing man to meet and very gregarious. And uh, it was an honor for me to have that opportunity. And, you know, and some of the other celebrities, uh, Gene Cernan, Last Man on the Moon, yeah, and then yeah. Shaquille O'Neal. I mean, I've, I've met a, a, just a broad spectrum and it's really cool. Some of them are just looking, you know, to um, charter a helicopter. Some of them are looking to purchase a helicopter. It's, everyone has a, a different need or requirement so it's been a tool and that's been a fun part too because you never know in this industry who you're going to meet yep yep yeah or when you meet them again you've got to be careful what you say about them <laughs> now something that you you've made very clear and you've you've mentioned it a few times about education and also about what your 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 mother said about you know money and men uh, but education can't be taken away and I know how much you believe in that. And um, you also use the famous Benjamin Franklin saying, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, but involve me and I learn. I mean, that's so important now, isn't it? For, for people coming into the industry and uh, make sure that they get fully involved in everything that they do and not just rely on somebody telling them what, where and when, but appreciating the why. You know, I even think up to my learning when, when I would struggle with some technical, you know, trying to understand a concept, but put me in that aircraft, show me, or whether it's a, you know, a transmission or an engine, bring me out to the shop and show me how it works. Now I remember. So I, that's why I love that line, because that's how I work. I can't read a textbook and pick it up. I have to be shown and work through it. And so one of the really cool things that I, I have fun because I love watching these kids just faces light up and they're looking at an aircraft in awe that there's a, a group, there's a, a Young Eagles that I've donated time to or I've taken a neighbor's kid up for his first flight or relatives or friends or even I've offered to colleagues at work, hey, if your child is, thinks they might be interested, you know, you never know until you're in that seat if you're going to be petrified to do it and hate it or you're going to love it and somebody gave me that chance so um i whenever i can i offer that up and try to coach and mentor kids in the aviation and take them up for their first flight and 
you know, there's two boys right now that uh, they just got, uh, well, just before COVID, they were awarded uh, captains for American Airlines or, excuse me, Delta Airlines. And just so proud of them. Like, hey, I gave them their first flight and um, and seeing what they've done today, it makes you feel good about what you, what I've, you know, what, what I've contributed and very, very proud of them. And, um, and that's another part for me. And I bring that up just because that, that's what makes me tick. I enjoy it. So um, I enjoy sharing and have fun doing it. But so going know. back to, yeah, going back to kids, like find or, or anybody interested, make sure, you know, find out what makes you tick, find out what enjoys you, you know, what's exciting to you because there's going to be bad times too. And there's times that I have been, as I said, petrified, but I had a passion for doing this and I knew here's where I wanted to go. And I just kept on course and kept to that vision. Yeah, so it's important to have that passion that you're going to give up, right? You're, you're going to throw in the towel early if you don't have it. Yeah. And, and, you know, a lot of times people chase the money, right? They want to get the best job. What's the, what's the near term, short term reward. And in my opinion, that's never successful. Find your passion and the money will come. But if you do something that you don't enjoy doing, you're not going to be, you're not going to be authentic to to that job and that position and when and I you know there's a woman Carla Copes that I love her her yeah. leadership styles and she talks about your authenticity being the heart of your power because yeah. that authenticity is what leads to passion and when you're passionate and you believe in what you have people just naturally they see you they're inspired by you they see your energy they want to follow you and that leads to leadership characteristics, right? You have people will follow you if they trust you and you're credible and you're passionate. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and it's important, that passion, because that also gives people an energy when they're low as well on their battery. So it's important. Yeah. Um, now, another thing that I know your style, you always believe in listening to good advice and pay attention to the signs and opportunities around you. Now, at this moment in time, with this damn crisis, what are the biggest challenges that are facing you in your position and your organization? I think, you know, what we're faced with is the fact that um, we're, everything is, and Zoom has helped, but we, you know, I was, before COVID, I was on the road constantly. I was always, it was important that I was touching base with my customers and establishing a relationship and um, having, a, having that foundation and trust and credibility with my customers and with my, my sales team and my employees. And definitely now the fact that we're not traveling at all, it's mission critical travel only. So we're not even in the office. Everyone is you know, working from home. So you really have to have ensure that you're main, uh, maintaining constant contact with your sales team. You never want somebody to feel like they're out there alone yep. and their voice is not being heard because they're gonna get very discouraged and their performance is gonna go down. And you know, you could potentially lose those employees. And, and it's more about, you, you want this collaboration, you want a team unity, right? You wanna be working for a common goal and cause because when you are, you can make all kinds of things happen. Yeah. So that's the, as a leader, I have to make sure, you know, no matter what, don't miss my weekly staff meetings. I need to make sure that I don't become overcome by events. And I find that, yeah, I'm working a lot longer hours, sometimes, you know, 11, 12 hours a day, but I have a salesperson over in Australia that I need to be available for, yeah. or in China. So um, there's a lot of give and take, but I think, I think companies worldwide recognize that uh, communication, communication is so important in what we're facing today. Yeah, even that, more so. uh, yeah. a lot of people yeah, with anxieties yeah. and, you know, other concerns and external pressures. It's, in, you know, it's difficult for them to keep focused if they're not being energized and led properly. Absolutely. You know, one of the, the I actually just got picked for a new team at uh, Lockheed Martin is calling what we call Mission First. And that is, we always feel like the, the customer's mission is our first priority. So how do we become, in this time of COVID, how, we, how do we ensure we have collaboration amongst all of the different divisions within Lockheed Martin 
to, to make sure that we're taking care of our customers properly. And uh, again, just got picked for it. I'm not sure where it's going to lead, but I'm happy to be part of that team because I think it's so important yeah. for our employees. Now, another, another, um, another famous saying, and I, I know you, you endorse this and, and you like it, which is from Zig Ziglar, about yeah. when you focus on problems, you'll, you'll have more problems. And when you focus on possibilities, you'll have more opportunities. I mean, that's so true in everything, isn't it? You see, you, almost, you can almost label people those that continually focus on problems and those that continually focus on, on possibilities and opportunities. And even in the media at the moment, all over the world, it seems to be so much more negative because they're focusing on all the problems that everything's happening now instead of possibilities and opportunities and clarity and straightforward messages. I, you know, that's so true. I always encourage my salespeople, and even sometimes it means I lose some good people, but they're going to a different group or division for them to focus on their possibilities. And, you know, that, that's actually one of my pet peeves, I would say, in the industry. I, one thing I, I, uh, I'm trying to find the right words here, but when I have somebody who's always negative and shoots things down and tells you why it doesn't work, that doesn't help you know like the people i admire are those who are creative and those who find a solution or say well it doesn't work but let's you know don't don't keep plopping problems in my lap yeah yeah you know unless you have a solution yep. and the people i really respect and admire in this in my in my company and in this industry are those who try to come up with creative solutions or try to find a path and don't just always out there throwing darts at why you can't get the job done. Yeah. You, you, you know, I know you need a balance, but that's, um, that's a pet peeve of mine when you have people who are like that. I, I want the creative people on my team and, you know, maybe it's my personality, the salesperson in me, but um, I appreciate creativity and possibility and possibilities thinking, yeah. you know, and being, as I mentioned, I, I think I learned, afterwards that my success has been being open to any possibility because that's how I found my path. I never thought in a million years when I was a kid, I never thought I'd ever be a pilot or fly a plane or fly a helicopter, no matter less, yeah. you know? So I look at how my path, like, you know, going from someone wanted to be a secretary <laughs> to then encouraged to be an engineer. And now where I am today, you know, what a great diversion, but, um, but it's, it's where I am today and I'm loving every minute of it. I don't want to retire. It's a fantastic story. So the continuation of the story. So I know that you've, and, and, and I love the name of some of these memberships. So you're a member of the Whirly Girls. I am. Hey, so I have a point on. Yeah, what a so, great yeah. point, you know, and a t-shirt and a baseball cap, the Whirly Girls. So tell us yeah. about the Whirly Girls. So, um, and I'm trying to remember, we just had a hundred and second birthday of her. It'll come back to me, the name, one of the original Whirly Girl members. So the Whirly Girls in a, is an association of female helicopter pilots. And I'm number 1582. <laughs> and my coin, my piece of jewelry I wear almost every day is a prized possession. So when you get inducted into the Whirly Girls, you're given a coin. And I had my coin made into a necklace with my number engraved on it. Um, and I did that, you know, because it reminds me of all the challenges and what I had to go through to get there. And out of everything I've done, I think that's something I'm most personally proud of. Because that was my biggest, biggest challenge and accomplishment to actually get that rating. It was scary for me. Now I, I, I'm like Odie the dog, whenever I can jump and, you know, grab the cyclic stick and get on board, I want to run and jump at it. But it was really, really scary for me in the beginning. And what I love about the Whirly Girls, it's, it's like a sisterhood of female pilots and we're all trying to help each other out. And there's a lot of young girls trying to get into helicopter aviation and it's expensive. So they need somebody to help them, guide them, make the introductions. It's all about networking. So yeah, we, you, yeah. you know, it's, a lot of scholarships are offered through the organization. So uh, that, that's probably one of my, my most favorite associations that I'm part of. No, that's brilliant. And you know, see how proud you are of, <laughs> of, the, uh, of the coin. And what about the 99s? 
So 99s was founded by Amelia Earhart, and yep. that is a fixed wing association. And there's local chapters all over the United States. And it's again, women pilots just, just getting together and encouraging each other to keep flying, addressing any issues and trying to get you know, younger girls into aviation and flying. There's women in, in aviation as well that I'm part of that's more of a professional networking, you know, for yeah. airline pilots and professional versus 99s is, I would say more of a sisterhood of, of those females of us who like to fly and enjoy it. And um, so it's, it's fun, it, they're, they're great organizations, but one thing I've always felt as a salesperson I need to give back to the community. I can't always be asking, you know, with my hand out, buy from me, buy from me, buy my product. I need to contribute as well. So um, I've gotten involved in some boards like the Eastern Regional Helicopter Council, the New England Helicopter Council, um, HA. I'm very active in those. And I think it, one, it helps me stay on top of the, you know, the uh, issues facing the community but also helps me give back to the community that I'm drawing from. That's fantastic. And, and it, shows, it shows how much you care as well, Janet. And uh, so now what I'd have to ask you is, so what do you do in your spare time? <laughs> well, in my spare time, I am a golfer. So Fantastic. I like to golf. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a golfer. Um, I'm also a boxer, something that would probably surprise you that you didn't see in my resume. So for exercise, I, I uh, love to get my frustrations out on a, on a heavy bag and try to box every, every day if I can get out there. But um, I, what I really enjoy doing is on the weekends I go flying. I, um, have a, have, I had a partnership in a plane. I, I didn't go and buy the plane, I couldn't afford it, but now I'm part of a flying club. And uh, go flying on the weekends. I do my instrument approaches if I need to go with an instructor. Mm -hmm. New England coastline is beautiful. Oh. You know, go fly over to Block Island for lunch, have that $100 hamburger. <laughs> and, uh, and I love like it. It's, um, hmm? I said like you do. <laughs> yeah. $100 hamburger. $100 hamburger, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. And we have, we have meetups and flying clubs. We get together, share stories. But you know, even that um, one thing, even though it's for fun, um, it, it still it keeps me current in the industry. We had an incident yeah. last, um, just, just a, uh, we were specking out an aircraft and they had to go into a, uh, into a lake house over water at night. And we were trying to, team was putting, putting in this huge search and rescue um, approach into the, into the pad and into the aircraft and putting a flight management system in there that can automate it. I'm like, why are you doing this? You know, there's what we call um, LP, LPV approaches that you can do or an RNAV approach that you can do that this new technology today that, you know, that's for pennies on the dollars versus what the engineering team was trying to engineer for this particular gentleman and, and their pilot to get them in safely at night over water in a really dark hole where the particular lake, you know, lake house was lake located, but just having them being practicing, me practicing those for fun of the weekend, <laughs> led to me like, wait a minute, we don't need to be going through all this. So it's really been helpful for me. And again, keeping me current and credible with my customers. That's fantastic. Now the last sort of quote, or the last sort of guideline that I've seen that you use is the six characteristics of a great leader. So loving your team, give praise, seldom use your power, cast your vision, surround yourself with rock stars and let them shine. And then most yeah. importantly, it's not about you, it's about your team. You support them with passion and they will run through fire for you. And then again from, um, from Cheryl, leadership is about making others better as a result of your presence and making sure that impact lasts in your absence. Right. Great yeah. statements. Uh, thank you. I think about that with Cheryl because I think about some of the people that I've admired in my career and why did I admire them? Well, because, you know, I learned from them while they, while I was in their presence and I will always remember each one of them, you know, not even when they're not with me, the guidance that they've provided. And, um, you know, I, I, my team members, my, my guys, I feel they really, we have a mutual um, respect for each other and not necessarily we love each other, but we're, we're really, really close and we take care of each other. And part of it is they know that I have walked the walk 
right? They know I have the operational capability and that I know what it, I've been a salesperson, so I know what it's like to be out in the field. And I've been a customer, I've been an operator, I have that operational capability. So I think they respect that about me, but they also call me fearless because they know that I will back them up no matter what, that, you know, if they're, whether, you know, I don't want to say if they're right, but if, if they've got the right intentions, they're doing the right thing, they're ethical, they know that I have no fear and I'll go up against anyone to make sure that we do what's right. And that's why I said, you know, it's not about you, it's about your team. And it's really important to support them with passion because, because of that passion, I know my guys have told me multiple times they'll run through fire for me because they know I'll do the same for them. And uh, it's, we have a wonderful, I always think, you know, we've, we've got the best sales team in the whole company <laughs> just because we've got such a great relationship. And it's, it's fun and we're very successful. We're making things happen. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. And it's a great way. It's a great way to finish. I'm not going to ask you what's next because that would probably be at least two or three sessions. <laughs> on the podcast. But um, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I know that your, your middle initial is L. I think it's something that stands for lucky because you've had a wonderful, wonderful experience full of memories. It's something that stands for likable. So on a first impression, I've, Thoroughly enjoyed this. Oh, and thank you. Clearly, you're a great leader, and um, you've got a love for the industry, which is which is very obvious. And uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. What a lovely, lovely journey you've had, and uh, I'm sure your parents are so so proud um, of what you've achieved. And um, incredible. So I would I would love to speak more, um, but we've run out of time. I wish you the greatest of success and your team and uh, hope we keep in touch. Thank you very much, Janet. Thank you, Chris, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Sincerely. All right.